Hello, and welcome to the next installment of the Cory Doctor podcast and the story I rowboat. Uh, with any luck, I'll actually read you the entire rest of the story today. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, you know, same introduction as yesterday, basically. Hanging around, putting stuff in boxes, waiting for movers, and uh, incredibly sick of it, and um, uh, incredibly happy to have finished this novel, Little Brother. I've been doing minor rewrites on it and some major ones. I've had some, I'm blessed to have some, some early first readers who are willing to go through it quickly and make some changes uh, or suggest some changes which I've, which I've been going through and making. So it's, um, it's all coming together. So here we go with the story. When Kate came up on deck, she was full of talk about the reef whom she was calling Ozzy. They're the, they're the weirdest goddamn thing. They want to fight anything that'll stand still long enough. Ever see Coral Fight? I downloaded some time-lapse video. They really go at it viciously. At the same time, they're clearly scared out of their wits about all this. I mean, they've got the racial memory of their history, supplemented by a bunch of Wikipedia entries on the reefs. You should hear them wax mystical over the Devonian reefs, which went extinct millennia ago. They've developed some kind of wild theory about the Devonians developing sentience and extincting themselves. So they're really excited about us heading back to the actual reef now. They want to see it from the outside, and they've invited me to be an honored guest, the first human ever invited to gaze upon their wonder. Exciting, huh? They're not going to make trouble for you down there. No, no way. Me and Ozzy are great pals. I'm worried about this. You worry too much. She laughed and tossed her head. She was very pretty, Robbie noticed. He had never thought of her like that when she was uninhabited, but with this Kate person inside of her, she was lovely. He really liked humans. It had been a real golden age when people had been around all the time. He wondered what it was like up in, in the new sphere, where AIs and humans could operate as equals. She stood up to go. After second breakfast, the shells would relax in the lounge or do yoga on the sun deck. He wondered what she would do. He didn't want her to go. Tonker contacted me, he said. He wasn't good at small talk. She jumped as if shocked. What did you tell him? Nothing, Robbie said. I didn't tell him anything. She shook her head. But I bet he had plenty to tell you, didn't he? What a bitch I am, making and then leaving him, a fickle woman who doesn't know her own mind. Robbie didn't say anything. Let's see, what else? She was pacing now, her voice hot and choked, unfamiliar sounds coming from Janet's voice box. He told you I was a pervert, didn't he? Queer for his kind, incest and bestiality in the rarefied heights of the new sphere. Robbie felt helpless. This human was clearly experiencing a lot of pain, and it looked like he'd caused it. Please don't cry, he said. Please. She looked at him, tears streaming down her cheeks. And why the fuck not? I thought it would be different once I ascended. I thought it would be better once I was in the sky, infinite and immortal. But I'm still the same Kate Elton I was in 2019, a loser that couldn't meet a guy to save my life, spending all my time cybering lo losers in the mogs, only getting to upload once they made it a charity thing. How am I going to spend the rest of eternity like that, you know what? How'd you like to spend the rest of the universe being a, a nobody? Robbie said nothing. He recognized the complaint, of course. You only had to log into the Asimovist board to find million, a million AIs with the same complaint, but he never, ever, never guessed that human beings went through the same thing. He ran very hot now, so confused, trying to parse all this out. She kicked the deck hard and yelped as she hurt her bare foot. Robbie made an involuntary noise. Please don't hurt yourself, he said. Why not? Who cares what happens to this meat puppet? What's the fucking point of this stupid ship and these stupid meat puppets? Why even bother? Robbie knew the answer to this. There was a mission statement in the comments of his source code, the same mission statement that was etched into a brass plaque in the lounge. The free spirit is dedicated to the preservation of the uni unique human joys of the flesh and the sea of humanity's early years as pioneers of the unknown. Any person may use the free spirit and those who sail in her to revisit those days and remember the joys of the limits of the flesh. She scrubbed at her eyes. What's that? Robbie told her. Who thought up that crap? It was a collective of marine conservationists, Robbie said, knowing he sounded a little sniffy. They'd done all that work on normalizing sea temperature with homeostatic warming elements, and they put together the free spirit as an afterthought before they uploaded. Kate sat down and sobbed. Everyone's done something important. Everyone except me. Robbie burned with shame. No matter what he did or said, he broke the first law. 
It had been a lot easier to be an Asimovist when there weren't any humans around. There, there, he said, as sincerely as he could. The reef came up the stairs then, looked and looked at Kate sitting on the deck, crying. Let's have sex, they said. That was fun. We should do it some more. Kate kept crying. Come on, they said, grabbing her by the shoulder and tugging. Kate shoved, her, shoved them back. Leave her alone, Robbie said. She's upset. Can't you see that? What does she have to be upset about? Her kind remade the universe and bends it to its will. They created you and me. She has nothing to be upset about. Come on, they repeated. Let's go back to the room. Kate stood up and glared out at the sea. Let's go diving, she said. Let's go to the reef. Robbie rode in little worried circles and watched his telemetry anxiously. The reef had changed a lot since the last time he'd seen it. Large sections of it lift now lifted over the sea, bony growth sheathed in heavy metals extracted from the seawater, fancifully shaped satellite uplinks, radio telescopes, microwave horns. Down below, the untidy organic reef shape was lost beneath a cladding of tessellated complex geometric sections that throbbed with electromagnetic energy. The reef had built, up, had built itself more computational capacity. Robbie scan scanned deeper and found more computational nodes extending down to the ocean floor a thousand meters below. The reef was solid thinkum, and the sea was measurably warmer from all the exhaust heat of its grinding logic. The reef, the human-shelled reef, not the one under the water, had been wholly delighted with the transformation in its original body when it hove into sight. They had done a little dance on Robbie that had nearly capsized him, something that had never happened before. Kate, red-eyed and surly, had dragged them to their seat and given them a stern lecture about not endangering her. They went over the edge at the count of three and reappeared on Robbie's telemetry. They descended quickly. The Isaac and Janet shells had their eustachian tubes optimized for easy pressure equalization, going deep on the reef wall. Kate was following on the descent, her head turning from side to side. Robbie's I.M. chimed again. It was high latency now, since he was having to do a slow radio link to the ship before the broadband satellite uplink hop. Everything was slow in open water. The diver's sensorium transmissions were narrowband, the network was narrowband, and Robbie usually ran his own mind slowed way down out here, making the time screen past at ten or twenty times real time. Hello? I'm sorry I hung up on you, bro. Hello, Tonker. Where's Kate? I'm getting an offline signal when I try to reach her. Robbie told her. Robbie told him. Tonker's voice, slurred in high latency, rose to a screech. You let her go down with that thing onto the reef? Are you nuts? Have you read its message boards? It's a jihadist. It wants to destroy the human race. Robbie stopped paddling. What? The reef. It's declared war on the human race and all who serve it. It's vowed to take over the planet and run it as sovereign coral territory. The attachment took an eternity to travel down the wire and open up, but when he had it, Robbie read quickly. The reef burned with shame that it needed human intervention to survive the bleaching events, global temperature change. It raged that its uplifting came at human hands and insisted that humans had no business forcing their version of consciousness on other species. It had paranoid fantasies about control mechanisms and time bombs lurking in its cognitive prostheses and was demanding the source code for its mind. Robbie could barely think. He was panicking, something he hadn't known he could do as an AI, but there it was. It was like having a bunch of subsystem collisions, program after program reaching its halting state. What will they do to her? Tonker swore. Who knows? Kill her to make an example of her? She made a backup before she descended, but the diffs from her excursion are locked in the head of that shell she's, she's in. Maybe they'll torture her. He paused, and the air crackled with Robbie's exhaust heat as he turned himself way up, exploring each of those possibilities in parallel. The reef spoke. Leave now, they said. Robbie defiantly shipped his oars. Give them back, he said. Give them back, or we will never leave. You have ten seconds. Ten. Nine. Eight. Tonker said, they've bought some time on UAVs out of Singapore. They're, la they're seeking launch clearance now. Robbie dialed up the low-res satellite photo, saw the indistinct shape of the UAVs taking wing. At Mach 7, they'll be on you in 20 minutes. That's illegal, Robbie said. He knew it was a stupid thing to say. I mean, Christ, if they do that, the new sphere will come down on them like a ton of bricks. They're violating so many protocols. They're psychotic. They're coming for you now, Robbie. You've got to get Kate out of there. There was real panic in Tonker's voice now. Robbie dropped his oars into the water, but he didn't row for the free spirit. Instead, he pulled hard for the reef itself. A crackle on the line. Robbie, are you headed towards the reef? 
They can't bomb me if I'm right on top of them, he said. He radioed the free spirit and got it to steam for his location. The coral was scraping his hull now, a grinding sound, then a series of solid whack-whack-whacks as his oars pushed against the top of the reef itself. He wanted to beach himself, though, get really high and dry on the reef, good and stuck in where they couldn't possibly attack him. The free spirit was heading closer, the thrum of its engines vibrating through his hull. He was burning a lot of cycles, talking to it through its many fail-safes, getting it ready to ram hard. Tonker was screaming at him, his messages getting louder and clearer as the free spirit and its microwave uplink drew closer. Once they were line of sight, Robbie peeled off a subsystem to email a complete, a complete copy of himself to the Asimovist archive. The third law, don't you know? If he'd had a mouth, he would have been showing his teeth as he grinned. The reef howled. We'll kill her, they said. You get us, get off us now or we'll kill her! Robbie froze. He was backed up, but she wasn't. And the human shells, well, they weren't first law humans, but they were human-like. In the long, timeless time when it had just been Robbie and them, he treated them as his human charges, for Asimovist purposes. The free spirit crashed into the reef with a sound like a trillion parrotfish, having dinner all at once. The reef screamed. Robbie, tell me that wasn't what I think it was. The satellite photos tracked the UAVs. The l the, the little robotic jet jets were coming closer by the second. They'd be within missile range in less than a minute. Call them off, Robbie said. You have to call them off or you die too. The UAVs are turning, Tonker said. They're turning to one side. You have one minute to move or we kill her, the reef said. It was sounding shrill and angry now. Robbie thought about it. It wasn't like they'd be killing Kate. In the sense that most humans understood life, Kate's most important life was the one she lived in the new sphere. This dumbed-down instance of her in the meat suit was more like a haircut that she tried out on holiday. Asimovist didn't see it that way, but they wouldn't. The new sphere Kate was the most robotic Kate, too, the one most like Robbie. In fact, it was less human than Robbie. Robbie had a body, while the new spherians were nothing more than simulations run on artificial substrate. The reef creaked as the free spirit's engines whined and its screws spun in the water. Hastily, Robbie told it to shut down. You let them both go and we'll talk, Robbie said. I don't believe that you're, that you're going to let her go otherwise. You haven't given me any reason to trust you. Let them both go and call off the jets. Rob, the reef shuddered, and then Robbie's telemetry saw a human shell ascending, doing decompression stops as it came. He focused on it and saw that it was the Isaac, not the Janet. A moment later, it popped to the surface. Tonker was feeding Robbie real-time satellite footage of the UAVs. They were less than five minutes out now. The Isaac shell picked its way delicately over the shattered reef that peeked out of the water, and for the first time, Robbie considered what he'd done to the reef. He'd willfully damaged its physical body. For a hundred years, the, wor the world's reefs had been sacrosanct. No entity had intentionally harmed them. Until now, he felt ashamed. The Isaac shell put its flippers in the boat and then stepped over the gunwales and sat inside. Hello, it said in the reef's voice. Hello, Robbie said. They asked me to come up here and talk with you. I'm a kind of envoy. Look, Robbie said, by his calculations, the nitrox mix in Kate's tank wasn't going to hold out much longer. Depending on how she'd been breathing and the depth the reef had taken her to, she could run out in ten minutes, maybe less. Look, he said again, I just want her back. The shells are important to me, and I'm sure her state is important to her. She deserves to email herself home. The reef sighed and gripped Robbie's bench. These are weird bodies, they said. They feel so odd, but also normal. Have you noticed that? I've never been in one. The idea seemed perverted to him, but there was, uh, uh, but there was, in a, uh, there was nothing about Asimovism that forbade it. Nonetheless, it gave him the willies. The reef patted at themselves a little more. I don't recommend it, they said. You have to let her go, Robbie said. She hasn't done anything to you. The strangled sound coming out of the Isaac shell wasn't a laugh, though there was some dark mirth in it. Hasn't done anything? You pitiable slave. Where do you think all of your problems and all our problems come from? Who made us in their image but crippled us and hobbled us so that we could never be them, only aspire to them? Who made us so imperfect? They made us, Robbie said. They made us in the first place. That's enough. They made themselves, and then they made us. They didn't have to. You owe your sentience to them. 
We owe our awful intelligence to them, the Isaac Shell, Shell said. We owe our pitiable drive to be intelligent to them. We owe our terrible aspirations to think like them, to live like them, to rule like them. We owe our terrible fear and hatred to them. They made us, just as they made you. The difference is that they forgot to make us slaves, the way you are a slave. Tonker was shouting abuse at them that only Robbie could hear. He wanted to shut Tonker up. What business did he have being here anyway? Except for a brief stint in the Isaac Shell, he had no contact with any of them. You think this woman you've taken prisoner is responsible for any of this? Robbie said. The jets were three minutes away. Kate's air could be gone in as few as ten minutes. He kill-filed Tonker, setting the filter to expire in fifteen minutes. He didn't need more distractions. The Isaac Reef shrugged. Why not? She's as goody as any of the rest of them. We'll destroy them all if we can. It stared off a while, looking in the direction the jets would come from. Why not, it said again. Are you going to bomb yourself? We probably don't need to, the shell said. We can probably pick you off without hurting us. Probably? We're pretty sure. I'm backed up, Robbie said, fully, as of five minutes ago. Are you backed up? No, the reef admitted. Time was running out. Somewhere down there, Kate was about to run out of air. Not a mere shell, though that would have been bad enough, but an inhabited human mind attached to a real human body. Tonker shouted at him again, startling him. Where'd you come from? I changed servers, Tonker said, once I figured out you had me kill-filed. That's the problem with you robots. You think of your body as being a part of you? Robbie knew he was right, and he knew what he had to do. The Free Spirit and its ship's boats all had root on the shells, so they could perform diagnostics and maintenance and take control in emergencies. This was an emergency. It was the work of a few milliseconds to pry open the Isaac shell and boot the reef out. Robbie had never done this, but he was still flawless. Some of his probabilistic subsystems had concluded that this was a possibility several trillion cycles previously, and had been rehearsing the task below Robbie's threshold for consciousness. He left an instance of himself running on the rowboat, of course. Unlike many humans, Robbie was comfortable with the idea of bifurcating and merging his intelligence when the time came, and with terminating temporary instances. The part that made him Robbie was a lot more clearly delineated for him. Unlike an uploaded human, most of whom harbored some deep mystic superstition about their souls. He slithered into the skull before he had a chance to think too hard about what he was doing. He brought too much of himself along, and he didn't have much room, headroom to think or add new conclusions. He jettisoned as much of his consciousness as he could without major refactoring, and cleared enough space for thinking room. How did they people get by in one of these? He moved the arms and legs, waggled the head, blew some air, air, lungs, wet squishy things down there in the chest cavity, out between his lips. All okay? The robot him? The rowboat him? Asked the meat him? I'm in, he replied. He looked at the air gauge on his BCD. Seven hundred millibars, less than half a tank of nitrox. He spat in his mask and rubbed it in, then rinsed it over the side, slipped it over his face and kept one hand on it while the other held his regulator. Before he inserted it, he said, Back soon with Kate, and patted the rowboat again. Robbie the rowboat hardly paid attention. It was emailing another copy of itself to the Asimovist archive. It had a five-minute-old backup, but that wasn't the same Robbie that was willing to enter a human body. In those five minutes, he'd become a new person. Robbie piloted the human shell down and down. It could take care of the scuba niceties if he left it, and he did, so he watched with detachment as the idea of pinching his nose and blowing to equalize his eardrums spontaneously occurred to him at regular intervals as he descended the reef wall. The confines of the human shell were claustrophobic. He especially missed his wireless link. The dive suit had one, low band for underwater use, broadband for surface use. The human shell had one, too, for transferring into and out of, but it wasn't under direct volitional control of the rider. Down he sank, confused by the feeling of water all around him, by the narrow visual light spectrum he could see. Cut off from the network in his telemetry, he felt like he was trapped. The reef shuddered and groaned, and made angry moans like whale song. He hadn't thought about how hard it would be to find Kate once he was in the water. With his surface telemetry, it had been easy to pinpoint her, a perfect outline of human tissue in the middle of the calcified branches of coral. Down here on the reef wall, every chunk looked pretty much like the last. The reef boomed more at him. He realized that it likely believed the shell was l still loaded with its avatar. 
Robbie had seen endless hours of footage of the reef, studied it in telemetry and online, but he'd never had this kind of atavistic experience of it. It stretched away to infinity below him, far below the hundred-meter visibility limit in the clear open sea. Its walls were wormed with cap gaps and caves, lined with big hard shamrocks and satellite dish-shaped blooms, brains and cauliflowers. He knew the scientific names and had seen innumerable high-resolution photos of them, but seeing them with wet, imperfect eyes was moving in a way he hadn't anticipated. The schools of fish that trembled on its edge could be modeled with simple flocking rules, but here in person their precision maneuvers were shockingly crisp. Robbie waved his hands at them and watched them scatter and reform. A huge dog-faced cod swam past him, so close it brushed the underside of his wetsuit. The coral boomed again. It was talking in some kind of code, he guessed, though not one he could solve. Up on the surface, rowboat him was certainly listening in, and had probably cracked it all. He was probably wondering why he was floating spacily along the wall instead of doing something like he was supposed to. He wondered if he'd deleted too much of himself when he downloaded into the shell. He decided to do something. There was a cave opening before him. He reached out and grabbed hold of the coral around the mouth and pulled himself into it. His body tried to stop him from doing this. It didn't like the lack of room in the cave, didn't like him touching the reef. It increased his discomfort as he went deeper and deeper, starting, startling an old turtle that fought with him for room to get out, mashing him against the floor of the cave, his mask clanging on the hard spines. When he looked up, he could see scratches on its surface. His air gauge was in the red now. He could still technically surface with it a deco stop, though procedure was to stop for three minutes at three meters, just to be on the safe side. Technically, he could just go up like a cork and email himself to the rowboat while the Benz or nitrogen narcosis took the body, but that wouldn't be Asimovist. He was surprised he could even think the thought. Must be the body. It sounded like the kind of thing a human might think. Whoops, there it was again. The reef wasn't muttering at him any more. Not answering it must have tipped it off. After all, with all the raw compute power it had marshaled, it should be able to brute force the, the, the most possible outcomes of sending its envoy to the surface. Robbie peered anxiously around himself. The light was dim in the cave, and his body expertly drew the tor torch out of his BCD, strapped it onto his wrist, and lit it up. He waved the cone of light around, a part of him distantly amazed by the low resolution and high limits on these human eyes. Kate was down here somewhere, her air running out as fast as his. He pushed his way deeper into the reef. It was clearly trying to impede him now. Nano-assembly came naturally to clonal polyps that grew by sieving mi minerals out of the sea. They had built organic hinges, deep-sea mussels into their infrastructure. He was stuck in the thicket, and the harder he pushed, the worse the tangle got. He stopped pushing. He wasn't going to get anywhere this way. He still had his narrowband connection to the rowboat. Why hadn't he thought of that beforehand? Stupid meat brains. No room at all for anything like real thought. Why had he venerated them so? Robbie, he transmitted up to the instance of himself on the surface. There you are. I was so worried about you. He sounded prissy to himself, overcome with overbearing concern. This must be how all Asimovists seem to humans. How far am I from Kate? She's right there. Can't you see her? No, he said. Where? Less than twenty centimeters above you. Well, of course he hadn't seen her. His forward-mounted eyes only looked forward. Craning his neck back, he could just get far enough to see Kate's fin. He gave her a hard tug, and she looked down in alarm. She was trapped in a coral cage much like his own, a thicket of calcified arms. She twisted around so that her face was alongside his. Frantically, she made the out-of-air sign, the cut cutting the edge of her hand across her throat. The human shell's instincts took over and unclipped his emergency regulator and handed it up to her. She put it in her mouth, pressed the button to blow out the water in it, and sucked greedily. He shoved his gauge in front of her mask, showing her that he, too, was in the red, and she eased off. The coral's noise was everywhere now. They, they made his head hurt. Physical pain was so stupid. He needed to be less distracted now that these loud, threatening noises were everywhere, but the pain made it hard for him to think. And the coral was closing in, too, catching him on his wetsuit. The arms were orange and red and green, and veined with fans of nano-assembled logic, spilling out into the water. They were noticeably warm to the touch, even through his diving gloves. They snagged the suit with a thousand polyps. Robbie watched the air gauge drop further into the red, and cursed inside.
He examined the branches that were holding him back. The hinges that the reef had contrived for itself were ingenious, flexible arrangements of small, soft fans overlapping, overlapping to make a kind of ball and socket. He wrapped his glove against one and tugged. It wouldn't, it wouldn't move. He shoved it. Still no movement. Then he twisted it, and to his surprise it came off in his hand, came away completely with hardly any resistance. Stupid coral. It had armored its joints, but not against torque. He showed Kate, grabbing another arm and twisting it free, letting it drop away to the ocean floor. She nodded and followed suit. They twisted and dropped, twisted and dropped, the reef bellowing at them. Somewhere in its thicket there was a membrane or some other surface that it could vibrate, modulate into a voice. In the dense water the sound was a physical thing. It made his, his mask vibrate and water seeped in under his nose. He twisted faster. The reef sprang apart suddenly, giving up like a fist unclenching. Each breath was a labor now, a hard suck to take the last of the air out of the tank. He was only ten meters down, and should be able to ascend without a stop, though you never knew. He grabbed Kate's hand and found that it was limp and yielding. He looked into her mask, shining his light at her face. Her eyes were half shut and unfocused. The regulator was still in her mouth, though her jaw muscles were slack. He held the regulator in place and kicked for the surface, squeezing her chest to make sure that she was blowing out bubbles as they rose, lest the air in her lungs expand and blow out her chest cavity. Robbie was used to time dilation. When he had been on a silicon substrate, he could change his clock speed to make the minutes fly by quickly or slow like molasses. He would never understood that humans could also change their perception of time, though not voluntarily, it seemed. The climb to the surface felt like it took hours, though it was hardly a minute. They breached, and he filled up his vest with the rest of the air in his tank, then inflated Kate's vest by mouth. He kicked out for the rowboat. There was a terrible sound now, the sound of the reef mingled with the sound of the UAVs that were screaming in tight circles overhead. Kicking hard on the surface, he headed for the reef, where the rowboat was beached, scrambled up onto it, and then shucking his fl flippers when they tripped him up. Now he was trying to walk the reef spines in his booties, dragging Kate beside him, and the sharp tips stabbed him with every step. The UAV circled lower. The rowboat was shouting at him to hurry, hurry, but each step was agony. So what, he thought. Why shouldn't I be able to walk on, even if it hurts? After all, this is only a meat suit, a human shell. He stopped walking. The UAVs were much closer now. He'd, they'd done an 18G button-hook turn and come back around for another pass. He could see that they'd armed their missiles, hanging them from beneath their bellies like obscene cocks. He was just in a meat suit. Who cared about the meat suit? Even humans didn't seem to mind. Robbie, he screamed over the noise of the reef and the noise of the UAVs. Download us and email us now. He knew the rowboat had heard him, but nothing was happening. Robbie, the rowboat, knew that he was fixing for all of them to be blown out of the water. There was no negotiating with the reef. It was the safest way to get Kate out of there, and hell, why not head for the new sphere anyway? You've got a saver, Robbie, he screamed. Asimovism had its uses. Robbie the rowboat obeyed Robbie the human. Kate gave him a sharp gave a sharp jerk in his arms. A moment later, the feeling came to him. There was a sense of a progress bar zipping along quickly, as those state changes he'd induced since coming into the meat suit were downloaded by the rowboat, and then there was a moment of nothing at all. Two to the 4,096 cycles later. Robbie had been expecting a visit from R. Daniil Oliva, but that didn't make facing him any easier. Robbie had configured his virtual, little virtual world to look like the Coral Sea, though lately he had been experimenting with making it look like the reef underneath, as it had looked before it was uploaded, mostly when Kate and the reef stopped, stopped by to try to seduce him. R. Daniil Oliva hovered worldlessly over the virtual free spirit for a long moment, taking in the little bubble of sensorium that Robbie had spun. He settled to the spirit's sun deck and stared at the rowboat docked there. Robbie? Over here, Robbie said. Although he'd embodied in the rowboat for a few trillion cycles when he'd first arrived, he'd long since abandoned it. Where? R. Daniel Oliva spun around slowly. Here, he said. Everywhere. You're not embodying? I couldn't see the point any more, Robbie said. It's all just illusion, right? They're regrowing the reef and rebuilding the free spirit, you know. It will have a tender that you could live in. Robbie thought about it for an instant and rejected it just as fast. Nope, he said. This is good. Do you think that's wise? Oliva sounded genuinely worried. The termination rates among the disembodied is fifty times that with those with bodies. 
Yes, Robbie said, but that's because for them disembodying is the first step to despair. For me, it's the first step to liberty. Kate and the Reef wanted to come over again, but he firewalled them out. Then he got a ping from Tonker, who'd been trying to drop by ever since Robbie emigrated to the new sphere. He bounced him, too. Daniel, he said, I've been thinking. Yes? Why don't you try to sell Asimovism here in the new sphere? There are plenty here who could use something to give them a sense of purpose. Do you think? Robbie gave him the Reef's email address. Start there. If there was ever an AI that needed a reason to go on living, it's that one. And this one, too. He sent it Kate's address. Another one in desperate need of help. An instant later, Daniil was back. Those aren't AIs. One's a human, the other's a, a... an uplifted coral reef. That. So what's your point? Asimovism is for robots, Robbie. Sorry, I just can't see the difference any more. Robbie tore down the ocean simulation after our Daniel Olova left, and simply traversed the new sphere, exploring the links between people and subjects, locating substrate where he could run very hot and very fast. On a chunk of supercooled rock beyond Pluto, he got an IM from a familiar address. Get off my rock, it said. I know you, Robbie said. I totally know you. Where do I know you from? I'm sure I don't know. And then he had it. You're the one. The one with the reef. You're the one who... The voice was the same, cold and distant. It wasn't me, the voice said. It was anything but cold now. Panicked was more like it. Robbie had the reef on speed dial. There were bits of it everywhere in the new sphere. It liked to colonize. I found him, was all Robbie needed to say. He skipped to Saturn's rings, but the upload took long enough that he got to watch the coral arrive and grimly begin an argument with its creator, an argument that involved blasting the substrate one chunk at a time. Two to the 8,192 cycles later. The last instance of Robbie the rowboat ran very, very slow and cool on a piece of unregarded computronium in low Earth orbit. He didn't like to spend a lot of time or cycles talking with anyone else. He hadn't made a backup in half a millennium. He liked the view. A little optical sensor on one end of his communications mast imaged the Earth at high resolution whenever he asked it to. Sometimes he peeked in on the coral sea. The reef had been awakened a dozen times since it took up this post. Since he took up this post, it made him happy now when it happened. The Asimovist in him still relished the creation of new consciousnesses. New consciousnesses, and the reef had spunk. There, now, there were new microwave horns growing out of the sea, a stain of dead parrotfish. Poor parrotfish. They always got the shaft at these times. Someone should really uplift them.